Yeah. This is the relevant podcast. It's episode 955, and it's the relevant podcast. Here in Orlando, I'm your host, Cameron Strang, and joining me from Loverland, Virginia, is Jesse Carey. Hello, hello. From Nacogdoches, Texas, is downtown Emily Brown. Hey, y'all. Uh, Jamie is out this week, and still, uh, you know, we're recording two shows while t- uh, Derek's here in Orlando. Joining me from my living room, artist, producer, mogul, Derek Miner. What's Ed? We have a great show in store for you today. Coming up later, uh, Trip Lee joins us. Uh, you know, he was on the podcast with Lecrae, what, a couple months ago? Uh, talking about the situation that came out at Reach Records. This is a totally different conversation. He has a new album out. It's the best album I've heard him do. It's great. I'm excited to have you have him on the show. Also, we have at the end of the show, your feedback. And up next, it'll be Slices. Quick question for Emily and Derek here. Okay. You guys have yes, recently traveled. Uh, Derek, uh, the day we're recording this, you traveled uh, to Orlando. Uh, right. Emily, you've recently got back from an international trip. Uh, I recently flew for only, I think, the second time since the pandemic. And, you know, we've all seen these videos of people just freaking out on the airplane or in the airport over just minor stuff, right? And I actually witnessed that in the Orlando airport last week, and it was glorious. Just people shouting. (laughs) It was in that line. You know how Southwest, they line you up? And, and, and there's no assigned right. seats, so it's a very tense situation because I feel like in the I don't know why Southwest does that. I think I don't know if they're just doing it to be different, but when you're standing there waiting to board, all you're doing is looking at the next person, thinking, "Do I have to edge that person out for, so I don't sit in the, get a middle seat?" Everyone's <laughs> thinking the same thing. Well, I saw two people just start screaming at each other in the Southwest line and brought like six other people into it. It was awesome. I loved it. I love. <laughs> Just public freakouts like that. Now, it didn't go to blows, but it was really fun to just sit back and watch them scream at each other. Emily and Derek, did you guys witness any tension traveling? Because I feel like I watch about 50 of these videos every day on the internet. I'm asleep most of the time. So, like, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to... I'm not gonna see much. But, uh, nah, it's been, it's been cool. Everybody, to be honest, I've traveled to Orlando and then I came back from LA not too long ago. The vibe has been straight. I think, you know, I've just been blessed to be with people that's just like, man, I'm over it. Like no more, whatever. Like people been kind of cool. So Derek, you just sleep on the plane? Yeah, like Oh yeah. As soon as as soon as it takes off. As soon as I sit down, I, my headphones are on, I'm not making eye contact, I shut my eyes, I'm I'm out. I'm out of here. I get really frustrated when people try to start conversations and stuff like that's Jesse. Bruh. So here's the deal. Jesse mm-hmm. and I have traveled the world <laughs> exactly. together. Jesse and I couldn't travel more differently. Jesse is chopping it up with everybody in the plane. He just asked you a question about ob- observing all these other people. Cause he's looking for a friend to talk to. He's looking uh-huh. all around. I'm like <laughs> hat on headphones on. Don't like, don't make eye contact with anybody. Just leave me alone. Jesse's like on the he's on the aisle seat. He's like the the guy turning around, talking mm. to the roads behind him. Emily, what's That's up? What's, what you? What happened with you? I, I like to make friends. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> what you, yeah. What's your vibe, Emily? I was gonna say I haven't seen any public freakouts. Um, the closest I got was um, the, on my flight to. So I had a layover in Madrid when I went to Paris, and the flight from Dallas to Madrid is like. I mean, like seven hours. So it's pretty long. Um, but on international flights, I think depending on which one you're on, you can get free alcohol. Um, so the closest freak out we got was the flight attendants had to cut a woman off from alcohol because she got too drunk on the plane. Um, and we were going to land at like 10 in the morning. So they were like, you can't really like, you need to like pick up. And she was like only a few rows in front of me. So I could, I could hear her kind of like, no, it's free. I want it. Like that was the closest it got. Um, I think also cause she didn't have her mask on. Like she was just like, I, I she probably had at least eight glasses of wine. Um, in, a few yeah. hours. Oh, so okay. <laughs> that was like right. the close, but like that was also, she was also drunk. So can't falter too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it when people freak out on airplanes. I love yeah. it. It's just great entertainment. Yeah. I saw yeah. someone lay down in the middle of the floor one time, like in the aisle and refuse to go back to their seat. They're like, no, I'm lying here. Was it like a sit in, like a protest or they were just like trying to stretch out and get some shut eye. 
they just wanted they just wanted to relax the back a little. But stop you know, playing. Bro. You I would lying. not lay down on that carpet. <laughs> right. I was team lady lying on the floor, not flight attendant in that situation. I'm like, look, seems like kind of lie there at your own wrist situation. It's another COVID origin story. Road tripping yeah. with your family, you know, you're in the back seat as a kid laying down on the floor and the big brother has the seat. I want to fly like like when I watch like Mad Men or something. And they have like a you walk around and you go up to you go up to like the bar upstairs and you just kinda it seemed like all these areas right. where people were just milling around on airplanes. Why don't we have that anymore? Why don't we just have a lounge? Those are very know? specific planes. Those are like the seven forty sevens with the upstairs and stuff. That's yeah. uh, they all need hall. to be converted. They yeah. all need to be converted. <laughs> Add a lounge to every plane. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great. All right. Well, before I toss to slices, I want to make sure you know about our brand new huge launch, Relevant Plus, our new premium ad-free subscription. With Relevant Plus, you'll get exclusive content like a special edition of this podcast, ad-free and released early each week, as well as our new podcast, Relevant Plus Conversations, which features full uncut interviews with the thought leaders and names you see in our magazine. You'll also get an ad-free, beautifully designed, enhanced edition of the digital magazine, ad-free, unlimited reading at relevantmagazine.com and other subscriber exclusives throughout the year. Get more info about Relevant Plus at relevantmagazine.com. Plans start as low as just two fifty dollars a month. Uh, if you like what we're doing, we would love the support. Uh, Relevant Plus allows us to give you a better content experience and it helps us do more of the content you love. So check it out. RelevantMagazine.com. Okay, stick around. Slices are up next. Listening to Yumi Zuma. The song is Astral Projection. Well, today's podcast is brought to you by the Lumo Project. Lumo is a cinematic visual Bible project that helps you see the gospel through a brand new lens. Experience Jesus' teachings and story in a compelling new way. Check out Lumo's free scripture videos by searching the Lumo Project at YouTube. And for other free resources, including small group studies and more, check out lumoproject.com. That's L-U-M-O project.com. Incredible organization. Great stuff. Okay, it's time for Bring the vibe. Oh yeah. Bring the vibe this week. Got a body roll right. with this one. We need the best music. What do you have, Jesse? <laughs> All right, I have a two for a uh, first one. Uh, I'll keep this. I'll keep the the first one pretty short. I just wanted to to highlight it. It was and and I'll give props to where I first came across it was a site, an aggregator called Christian Headlines, which pulls in news stories uh, of, of of faith based interests from around the internet. And they spotlighted it's five churches. One is in uh, Charlotte. A lot, most of them are honestly in the South. Uh, one's in uh, uh, Greensboro, a couple in North Carolina, one in Alabama. But a lot of these churches are doing specific um, sort of campaigns within their church for people to give at the increments of $25, which the church then converts into gas cards and offers to members of the community. Wow. Um, so uh, there are churches uh, across the country. Obviously, we're in, you know, there's a lot of global tensions and, and a lot of for a lot of different factors, gas prices, prices are rising really rapidly. And often the people most affected are people who, uh, you know, are, are already kind of hard pressed for 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 money. And so what these churches are doing is uh well, you know, they, they interviewed one pastor who actually donated $10,000 out of his own salary. His name's Brian Karn, and he's the pastor of Kingdom City Church in Charlotte. Um, but they're just buying up gas cards and posting online, hey, the first 300 people from the community that need to put some gas in their tank this week, come by the church and, get, and collect your gas card. But it's kind of a trend breaking out in churches, and I just wanted to spotlight it because... It's one of those, hey, can we get more of that type of thing? Because it's it's a practical way 
to help people kind of in, in, in a strenuous time. So that's, that's, that's number one of the two first. So props to those churches. If your church is giving away gas cards to members of the community who need it, I, it seems like you're doing something right. Okay. The second one is I wanted to spotlight a study that ran in the personality and social psychological bulletin. And this study was, uh, conducted by a man named Dr. Winan Van Tilburg of the University of Essex. And it was to determine what are the most boring jobs and boring hobbies in the world. <laughs> now, if you're studying boredom professionally, I suggest you have a name like Dr. Win John Van Tilburg of the University of Essex. That's the, like, the only thing worse than being bored is studying boredom. But hey, somebody's <laughs> got to do it, I guess. We all need content to think about. Uh, but so, so they, this was a, a, a large survey. Uh, the five most boring jobs. Number one. Anyone want to make a guess? Five most boring jobs. Toll booth. No, I guess you see people. Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Amazon assembly line packer. I don't know. It, you would, you so would think it would be more yes. kind of manual labor stuff. But, but they said, this, you know, like I work at a candy factory and it's the same thing. Just getting it's Laverne and Shirley. You know, you're just on the line. Well, you're capping bottles. You're cleaner. just all day long. Cleaner made the top five. Yeah, you know, people oh. who, who clean professionally made, made top five. Uh, that was number four. The top three are data analysis, mm -hmm. uh, accountant, uh, and taxes, or, or someone who prepares taxes and insurance. I think those would be incredibly boring. But they, th but here's how they define, here's the survey for the most exciting jobs. Uh, one, a job in the performing arts, which I guess if you're an actor or a musician or so, Derek, I feel like you have a pretty exciting job. Yeah, um, yeah sometimes. Uh, Oh, wait, what are you two. talking about? You got you're creating, you're like traveling, you're 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 changing people's lives, you're giving them memories, you're rocking stages, people adore you. What are you talking about? Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about what one percent of the job, right? The other ninety nine percent is just stress and right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's writing it's writing my lyrics out for genius. I know. <laughs> I know. I was setting you up. There's nothing nothing is as glamorous as it seems, right? I mean, like for that one percent right. that the public sees, it's like there's a lot of grind that goes into it. Where, where, yeah, where so. that's the thing. Like the public perception is one thing. So performance performing arts number two was science. Like that oh. seems like one of the most boring jobs to me. Like unless you're doing no, like, you're doing wacky experiments all day. Is it just science in general? It was just science. Okay. Just science. I mean, there's a lot the profession that of goes. science. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, but that's really, nice. people. But here's where I had a beef with this list. Are y'all seeing? Wait, are you, hold on. Are y'all seeing what's going on with Derek? I can't, this he keeps getting up because there's a candy bar right behind him. I have a candy bar set out, and he keeps getting up to go get more candy during the recording. It's hilarious, <laughs> bro. Because the candy is over here. You think I'm just gonna look at the Twix and not eat hey, it, bro? I knew you were coming. Wrong? I refilled the bowls last night, literally, because I was like, I gotta have the fresh candy uh, supply for Derek. I know that he likes to graze. I didn't know that it would be a distraction during the show but so the number three most exciting profession according to uh, race car driver dr dr van tilburg um <laughs> and his astute research journalism what? let me tell you something yeah. as someone who's been in this field <laughs> a long time unless you think reading mean comments from strangers is exciting then i suggest you find a, a more exciting <laughs> profession because that's i'm convinced most of journalism now is doing the actual work but just sitting there for hours and reading what strangers are presuming about you online it is not as exciting look it is exciting sometimes <laughs> But uh, not not quite as exciting as science or performing arts. Or, that, that's or, all. Or athlete, race car driver. I mean, I'm watching Formula that or Drive science. to Survive show on Netflix. Yeah. That's that that's adrenaline nonstop. I mean, that's a little yeah. bit more exciting than journalism. I would say like go kart test driver. <laughs> Pretty exciting. I'm sure someone does it. I'm sure yeah. someone's got to test them. We talked to the guys when we went last week. The guys who work there and drive what it. What about stunt man? Stunt man? Yeah. That, yeah. Did, they have, did they have stunt man on there? Dr. Van Tilburg's been studying boredom too long. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. All right. What do you have, Emily? Um, I have a really sad um some sad news to share. Uh Netflix is cracking oh, no. down on sharing passwords. So if you share Good. like an account with anyone, um, they're gonna start charging you more, like per account. Or that's what their plan is so far. Um, this is really upsetting to me personally because 
I share my net or I share honestly most streaming platforms with minimum four people. So I this is really frustrating because it's going to start costing more. And like, I just really can't afford that right now. And also, I don't understand why Netflix needs this. Like, they're doing fine. They're just I think they need they're money. They have shareholders. Personally. They yeah, and that's annoying. Like, well, but come on. Me... I mean, I'm like a I'm a justice person. I'm a right and wrong person. <laughs> and that's annoying. You pay for one subscription <laughs> and you're floating a whole extended friends and family network. Nah. Uh, I God that. cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. Enough. Oh my gosh. But no, like so I my frustration is Netflix already raised the price, but their content has not really cha- like i'm i'm on we're going on what year three of waiting for the next season of stranger things like if you're gonna charge me give me some real good content and things on time don't make me wait for the stuff i actually want like i don't know i just i think if they mm. like mm. i really think within the last year hbo max has really stepped they're still the worst like interface but they've really stepped up their content so if HBO Max was like you need to pay more for the it content is fire yeah I'd be like you know what that's valid you're giving me real good content Netflix pretty mediocre lately so if you're gonna make me pay more money you better give me some better content that's all I'm saying that is interesting mm. that they're doing this while pretty much the perception is that they're putting out mediocre stuff you think they would do this right when the new season of Stranger Things is starting yeah. or something like that where like you know there's a lot of you know, demand for Netflix. Cause right now yeah. it's kind of like, Oh, I can live without Netflix. <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's like, I guess I'm going to watch a five hour true crime docu series about a vegan restaurant tonight. Cause that's <laughs> what I'm being off. I did. <laughs> I, first of all, I did. And it was fascinating. So thank you very much. Anyway. All right. Uh, what do you have, Derek? Y'all hear, um, push T's tease this record to McDonald's. So push T has a, <laughs> he has a, um, <laughs> Yeah, Pusha C has a, a collaboration with Arby's, and he's going after the McDonald's filetto filet fish. And I'll put it this way: like I, I would never beef with Pusha T. Like this <laughs> man, anybody that could eat their McDonald's for Arby's, because first of all, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm I'm around a bunch of my white brothers and sisters. I don't know if y'all know, but black people don't really mess with Arby's like that. Just on a on a typical level, I would say. Seven out of ten black people probably are not big Arby's fans. That from uh-huh. in my circle that I know, you know what I mean. Right. So for a man to like, it's I, not good. It's, it's, it's so gross. People hate Arby's. Like I don't know why. I'm I ain't gonna lie. I'm with Kev on stage. Arby's ain't that bad to me. I mess with the curly fries. Right. No, I'm saying, person, I, I don't say the roast, roast beef sandwich is good, but they, I have I bad. enjoy the roast beef sandwich. I have friends who enjoy their Jamocha shakes, but I haven't been to an Arby's in five plus years i don't know how they stay in business because you have people who actually hate arby's and then those of us who yeah. don't hate arby's don't go to arby's how are they right. around i i just i just appreciate appreciate that push a t has been t- entirely comfortable building a, his career on cocaine and pettiness that yes. is the push a t story yes. <laughs> that he is started it. coke rap and then just got very petty and i love yes. it yes He's just like, he's just like, listen, I'm going to rap about selling Coke and I'm going to dish you. And that is how we're going to make my money. So I'm like, hey, look, and the, the I'm telling and the beat is crazy on this disc record. Like, I'm like, yo, Push, you should have kept this for the album, dog. Like this, you should have gave him one of the, the, the B-level beats. It's not like you got Kanye to, to make this. I ain't going to lie. So, it, I mean, if you haven't heard it, it's definitely worth listening to. And, uh, Hey, it's fire. That's all I got. All right, play, play a clip. Play a clip, Clark. I'm the reason the whole world love it. Now I gotta crush it. Filet your fishes. Then you should be disgusted. How dare you sell a square fish asking us to trust it? A half slice of cheese. Mickey D's on a budget. All these crispy fish is simply it. With lines around the corner, we might need a guest list. Push up brings stinger missiles to knife fights. Like, I'm telling you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he he don't play. I would never diss with Push. I'm just gonna let you know, yeah. and I consider my pen to be pretty strong, but yeah. he just has a level of savage that is just it's just crazy. <laughs> Drake is one of the most rich and famous people in the world. When Pusha did that whole song, I, I felt deep, deep empathy for I Drake. I Thanks. think Drake I won did. that one. I'm sorry. I think Ooh, I think he what? came back, back to back. I'm sorry. I don't know. 
Okay. Back to back was Meek Mill. That wasn't. Oh, that's Drake what I'm thinking didn't. of Meek. I'm not thinking of Pusha. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the Meek yeah. battle. I think he destroyed no. Meek. He Drake, destroyed Drake Meek. Took an yeah. L yeah. on that one. That was. Yeah. That was. Yeah. That was an L. That was an yeah. L. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that'll do it for slices. Stay tuned. Up next, Triple E joins us. Listening to Dent May, the song is Crying Laughing. Well, today's show is also brought to you by the Evil Good Film. Let me ask you a question. How far would you go to protect the ones you love? I'm guessing as far as you had to. That's exactly the premise of Hillsong Channel's new film, Evil Good, a gripping true crime documentary about faith in action. Set amidst the violent and drug ravaged streets of Phoenix, the film tells the true story of ex police detective Victor Escoto whose life is plunged into chaos when death threats are made against his family. Forced to take extreme measures to keep them safe, Victor must wade out into the darkness to confront not only those who wish to do him harm, but also the ghosts of his past, which have haunted him for far too long. Throughout it all, Victor is tested as he treads that line of faith and works, trusting God on one hand while on the other getting down in the trenches and doing what's necessary. So if you're looking for a different kind of Christian cinema and this blend of true crime and faith is for you, you can stream Evil Good at theevilgoodfilm.com. That's theevilgoodfilm.com. Where our guest today is Trip Lee, an incredible artist and pastor. He's been leading the way for Christian hip hop for years, still putting out great new music. Uh, Trip sat down with our very own Tyler Huckabee to discuss what's next for him, what he thinks about the future of hip hop and the church, and his new project. Here is our conversation with Trip Lee. Never too late. That ain't my way. Right at the gate, all in your face. Preaching away. Right at the gate, quick in my pace. Right when I wait. Right at the gate, I know my place. Right when I wait. Man, that's right at the gate. So over the last few years, you've been you've been in this game for a while. You're you're seasoned now. How do you feel like your perspective on this art has changed? Maybe what's most surprised you about some of your evolution as an artist? Look, it's it's hard for me to even put myself in the mind space of Young Trip because it was just such a. Uh, I don't even know what I thought I was going to do. Honestly, I love Jesus and I love hip hop, and I was like, I want to make songs about Jesus. Uh, and I want to make songs that impact people. Um, yeah, but my perspective has changed a lot. Um, I think maybe one of the things that would surprise young me the most is my starting place for some songs. Early on, for me personally, it's in everybody in my space, everybody I even did music with. Um, I kind of approached songs from a from a place where I started with a truth I wanted to communicate and then just try to do that creatively. Um, and now that's not always the case. Often I'm starting from just somewhere I'm at emotionally or something I'm seeing going on in the world. And it's not to say I never did that, but you know, it was, it has so much to do with where I was at that time in my life, where it was like, there were a lot of things that were new to me about who God is. And I was just learning a lot of brand new things about scripture. Um, whereas I, I still am learning new things about scripture. I'm also being reminded of things all the time in scriptures that I need to be reminded of. I mean, this is what Peter talks about. He's talking about, you know, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. When someone like me, when you're a learner like me, it can be very tempting to only be excited about new stuff as opposed to something, again, that you've already heard that you need to be reminded of. And I want that stuff to impact me just as much. Um, but in this season, I have been starting more songs in different places, which I think has made my music more well-rounded and more versatile. Um, and even opens up new avenues for me songwritably, where there are ways I could even box myself in creatively sometimes, um, where I want to be able to do the best of, uh, yeah, I just want to keep growing and be able to be just as clear with the truth and continue to do it in all different kinds of ways. Wish my dogs would say, from Bristol's they fight. Wish our world went in program to see thug on my face. Wish I knew it'd be better for my kids. They wouldn't grow up with violence.
with this album uh, do you feel like there is sort of a is there a cohesive statement to what you're saying here do you just you, you decide to put out an album when you get enough tracks in the can or do you feel like there's really an overarching message here that is one thing that I've been less strict with myself about than I used to be in the past um, because it, and, and some of it could be you know like I have written books and I've pastored and I don't have to say everything I have to say in my music in ways that I maybe used to and so this again is not like discounting my old music like part of why I wrote music like that is because music like that impacted me deeply and I've seen that do that you know what it, it really was like I was just writing songs. That's the thing is like, before I was even knew I was working on the record, I was just writing songs every day. That was part of the good creative place I was in. It's just every day I was just writing stuff. And like some of them I was like singing and just playing chords and singing. It's like, I wasn't even rapping. So it was like, I'm not planning on this to go anywhere. But what it meant was all these songs just really represented the phase of life I was in, the season I was in, the stuff I was feeling, stuff I was seeing. And so as I was gathering the songs, I thought worked for this record. Um, there was one, um there was an interlude called the end um that's on there and it says the end of me may taste bittersweet but that's where you tend to be i always find your face where my eyes can't see strength can be the enemy show me the way to the end of me and that kind of coming to the end of ourselves the end of our strength things not working out the way we hope um that felt like a common theme in, in my music a lot of it having to do with you know, the challenges that have come from my health and other just things in these past several years, things that I thought would work out in particular ways, ways where I felt like, man, I haven't been able to complete anything for this season of time. Um, that felt like a common theme in the music and that I felt like a lot of people have been feeling because of how strange this last few years has been. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a theme, kind of a thread going through it, um, through the record. Might get me a that you've seen in people pick, yeah. I might set the green so everything I want I get, yeah I might pack up Nina so they team know we ain't here, yeah I might cut some deal for my fit and it's lit Might get me a private jet so I'm curious, as a Christian, um, do you ever feel pressured to put sort of a happy ending to your songs, even if maybe it's not something you're feeling in the moment, honestly, just as a person, do you feel like you have to pin a little, well, God's got this to the end of songs about difficult times that you're struggling with? Maybe I used to feel that pressure. Um, I certainly don't feel that pressure right now. You know, like, so I have a weird thing where I really like songs that express heartbreak really well just in my own personal listening taste um uh, you know from like marvin Gaye put this album out after he got divorced it was like crazy like i like breakup songs too like i think i like hearing heartbreak expressed well so even apart from christians lamenting like i just like when people are able to i find that compelling and interesting you know what i'm saying like also, like Marvin Gaye to even like folks like Sufjan Steve, like my dude be putting all the heartbreak in stuff. Phoebe Bridges, you know, um, uh, like I like music that does that. Um, Olivia Rodrigo, I think she does that good. Some of her breakup songs, it, whether or not I can even relate to it, I find it compelling musically. Um, I remember when I first heard her, some of her joints, I was like, I feel embarrassed, but this is really good. Like she's a very good songwriter. She's capturing these thoughts and feelings really well um and i i think christians expect that that we do that i think this is one of the things that can improve about our worship music is i think we are too invested in things sounding happy and we think praise has to come from a happy place all the time when that's just not what we see in the scriptures if you just open the psalms and you're like i'm gonna just find something enlightening and happy today and you just land it might be david like i wish i was never born like that's how some scripture sounds the psalms sound very depressed and anxious at times and there's a brutal honesty in it i think is really healthy for us and i think sometimes christians are confused when life doesn't go that way because we've heard a picture of life that's not reality from leaders but if you read job if you read ecclesiastes if you read the psalms it's like you're gonna get a lot more of a realistic picture than christians like to paint sometimes and so to me it feels like one of my personal philosophies i want my music in my music, I want life is hard and God is good to exist right beside each other. I do not want to act like I have to choose one. I don't think it's healthy for me to pretend like that. I don't think it's healthy for Christians to live in that false reality. Um, and so I, it, it feels like 
and even in some of the worship stuff that I want to write eventually, um, and some stuff that I have written that I haven't put out, like I want Christians to sing these songs together when we're honest about it. I do think it's present, especially in a lot of gospel and it's present in plenty of Christian music, but I want there to be more. And, and I think it's, it would be healthy for us. Last question for you. Uh, what are some of the songs on this album that you're extra pumped about? Like, like what are some of the songs that you're really, really excited for people to hear that you feel really, really proud of? Yeah, this is a hard question right now since it just came out because I love to, it, I, it's, it's hard for me to separate how I feel about songs from how people react to them. Of course, once I'm done, when I'm making them, every song feels like when I do it, I'm like, this is it. This is the best thing I've ever made. I did it um, until I'm working on the next one. But and then by the time it comes out, I can't tell what's good at all because I've heard it all too much. But um you know, uh, right at the gate, which is when we put the single off last, that seems like one people really love, excited to do that one live. Dreaming is one where I, you know, in the way that I like songs that are really honest about heartbreak and navigating that, that one is about me trying to figure out how to be a dreamer when everything is hard like that. Um, and then uh, probably one more would be a song called, yeah, Stone, which is one of my favorite ones. It's one of the ones that my homie Michelle, who I worked with a lot, um, he he produced that one. And I feel like it captures some of the influences that went into what the album sounds like. Analog synth stuff, psychedelic rock stuff that I had just been rocking with and liked. It was like, can we find ways, let's find ways to incorporate that into, into what we're doing. Um, yeah, it feels like one of the ones that's like, oh, we did it. This is what we did. See my ankle fade, laughing daily, dangerous face, eyes on that last day, long for that but can't just wait, call his name, I say my crate, said he say my, say my place. That was Trip Lee, make sure to check out his new project, The End, it's out now, really good. Stay tuned up next, it's your feedback. I'm gonna prove my love. You're listening to John Mark McMillan. The song is Prove My Love. It's time for your feedback. Last week, we asked you what one song that you love do you think should be remade and by who? Where did this come from? Well, I don't remember the, the uh, Dolly impetus Parton. for this question. Dolly Parton, That's right. Dolly Parton um, wanted Jolene to be like sung Jolene by to get remade by Beyonce. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, something like that. She wanted to turn into an epic thing like Whitney did with I'll Always Love You. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. So what song do you love that should be remade and and by whom? You hit us up on Twitter at Real Podcast. Here's a few of our favorites. Yeah, Matt, Matt Lundy gave a handful, but I want to spotlight one that is a fantastic pick. He said that Boney Bear should cover the Eagles classic Hotel California. Dude, what a oh. game changer. I would Ooh. absolutely, it would be weird and awesome and a fantastic call, Matt Gundy. We need to get the Boney Bear folks on, on, on the blower right now. I, I like uh, David LW80's uh, suggestion. He wants to see Jesus Freak redone by Derek Minor. <laughs> that's gonna be a that's gonna be a no for me, dog. But um <laughs> but I mean no lie though, but listen. When I was uh, touring with the Newsboys, probably like 2016, I did rap Toby Mac's verse. You did while not. my man was no. on the spinning drum set. No lie, I Can had you never still do it? no no lie. I had never Is heard the song it? before. <laughs> I don't know. It's got to be. It's in somebody's to cell phone somewhere. I no lie, <laughs> but yeah. Also, you but, said that's a no for me, dog, which reminded me obviously of Randy Jackson. When right. Jason and I went to the Magic game last week, he was certain that in the front row sitting directly across from us during the game was one Randy Jackson. And I was like, Randy Jackson is not at the Orlando whatever game. <laughs> Brooklyn. So let's go. Brooklyn. He, could have been. he could have been at a golf tournament or whatever. <laughs> he was not there. I approached but Jesse, him a certain and... Randy Jackson was at the Orlando Magic game last week. Well, he signed his autograph, Randy Jackson, for me when I said, Randy Jackson, please sign this. Because if you see Randy Jackson or someone who looks like Randy Jackson, yeah. Yeah, I like Midnight Train to Georgia, uh, remixed by Leon Bridges. I think that would be Ooh. amazing. Ooh, that would be a Ooh. good one. That should just happen. That would be crazy. Um, the the Lucy Esther said that. Um, 
I like the someone suggested the song The Boy Is Mine remade by Ariana Grande and Kim Kardashian. Uh-huh. Um, musically, what obviously. Kim Ariana Kardashian can't great. sing? You know, I, I don't think she can. I'll be honest. Um, maybe she can surprise yeah, why us. We, why do we I, want her involved? We don't want her involved. Because of Pete Davidson. So it's just like them like fighting over Pete Davidson. And like, there's so many songs about Pete oh, Davidson already. Okay. And I just think it's okay. so funny that they're trying to push for another one. Um, but I would love to hear Aaron Grande sing The Boy Is well, Mine. I think she would be amazing at it. But not Kim. So sorry, Kim. You said there's a lot of songs about Pete Davidson? There's a, I mean, Aaron Grande has a song called Pete. Yeah. Literally called Pete. As goes to yeah. show how many Ariana songs I've heard. Well, yeah, if you're if you're a guy, I don't know why you would date Ariana Grande or uh, uh, T- Taylor Swift because, like, you know, you're ending up in songs. We're not a whole lot of this, Cameron. We a whole lot of angsty <laughs> girls are going to hate you forever. I, okay, why would you? You're acting. You're going to sit there and act like a male singer has never written a song about a girl. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like the iconic ones where they call out the guy by name in this era, internet culture, tabloid culture. Yeah. Taylor and Ariana are like she has a song named Pete. I mean, it's like poor Pete Davidson. I'm sorry. I, I mean, well, it's when know. they were together. So it was not going to let you live, bro. Tay Tay is not going to let you live. It's nope. not Taylor Swift's fault that the songs she writes are more popular than the ones that are written about her. You know, like she's just, she can't help okay. it that she's talented. Okay. So All right. if, All right. if men wanted to write songs about her, maybe they could write something better. That's really, they need to rise to the occasion. <laughs> Man, look, you write a song about Taylor <laughs> Swift w- and you might as well just go on and hop in your That's casket like calling early. Out- Push a T in a in a rap battle. You do not. You do not just just leave it alone. You do not want to write a song about Taylor Swift. John Mayer has a song she, about Taylor Swift, and Taylor Swift has a song about John Mayer, and Taylor's is more memorable. Right. I'm just saying. Of course. Mm. Uh, so okay, I would. You don't date her, and you don't write songs about her. That's the golden rule. All right. Uh, there's a lot more feedback where that came from. Go check it out on the at relevant podcast Twitter replies. You can see them. Uh, okay, it's time for this week's editorial question of the week. Hey. All right. Well, earlier we were talking about Pusha T and we were just talking about Taylor Swift and Ariana. Uh, <laughs> what's your, f- this is a question this week. What's your favorite diss track of all time? And I, extra points if it's like a sneaky one that's not known as a diss track, mm. but like there's an element in it that's clearly a diss track, like a sneaky diss track. But no, just what's your favorite diss track of all time? Uh, whether it's a mm. mixtape or back to back by Drake or whatever, you know, just hit us up and uh, we will mm. go through our favorites next week. Uh, that's gonna be fun. Derek, do you have any diss tracks? <laughs> do I have diss tracks? He disses the yeah. devil in every. <laughs> no, nah, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. I worry about beef because I, I don't <laughs> know if I have the the ability to not do something in real life if somebody say something crazy so i try to <laughs> i try to keep my words um you know what i'm saying i try to choose yeah, my words that's smart selectively that's a smart way to do you it. know what i'm saying yeah i've tried to choose some words. but but you know i mean if it's a problem <laughs> I ain't got no problem with it, dog. Like, hey, look, I'll just let you know. Just be prepared to go there, bro. I got a little you know what I'm saying? Just be prepared to go there. There you go. All right. Hit us up on Twitter at Relevant Podcasts or follow us on Instagram. We'll post it there in the stories and you can uh, reply there as well. Well, before we wrap things up, I'm going to thank Trip Lee for joining us today. Make sure to check out his new album, The End. It's out now. Um, Internally, our team, we think it's his best project yet. It's really good. Also, make sure to check out the brand new issue of Relevant. The spring issue is out now. It's It features an amazing lineup. We have Ryan Reynolds on the cover, Channing Tatum, Brooke Ligerwood, Maisie Peters, Judah and Lyon, Wande, so much more. It's packed. You can read the ad-supported version at relevantmagazine.com. And for the ad-free enhanced edition, subscribe now to Relevant Plus. You can get all the info and sign up for instant access there at relevantmagazine.com. Also, while you're at the site, make sure to check out our daily devotional series, Deeper Walk, which is presented by Lumo. There's a morning devotional email you can sign up for, or you can just check out our morning devotionals every morning. We post them first thing right there in the faith section at relevantmagazine.com. Also, hey, if you like the show, tell us. Uh, Leave a review, rate and review it wherever you listen, whether it's Apple, Spotify, anywhere you get it. It helps the algorithm, helps uh, people find the show, and we appreciate the feedback. Okay, on that note, we'll wrap it. I'm Cameron Strang. 
I'm Jesse Carey. I'm Ellie Brown. I'm Derek Minor. We will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. for listening to The Relevant Podcast. Check out our features, interviews, and news updates every day at relevantmagazine.com. And make sure to follow Relevant on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest. For more great podcasts, browse the shows on The Relevant Podcast Network, which you can find at our site. And while you're there, don't miss the all-new era of Relevant Magazine. A new issue releases every other month at relevantmagazine.com. I love it when people freak out on airplanes. Relevant Podcast Network.